Hi, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth lecture in the Decolonizing Curating and the Museum in Southeast Asia series, uh, which is jointly organized by the Southeast Asia uh, Art Academic Program, SOAS University of London, and the Asian Civilizations Museum, Singapore. Uh, let me just share my screen really quickly um, to show you, you know, we still have two more uh, talks in the series after today. Uh, you can scan the QR code in the top right hand corner uh, of the screen uh, just to get the registration links for the, the next two, which is next Thursday and then the Thursday after. Uh, I just want to uh, thank our Foy Foundation and the Chris Foundation uh, for their support uh, for this webinar series. Um, and, you know, just because people have asked before, uh, we are recording today's session uh, and it will be made available on the SOAS uh, Center for Southeast Asia page afterwards. Um, so don't worry, you can access it uh, afterwards too. Um, so my name is uh, Conan Cheong. I'm the curator at uh, the ACM for Southeast Asia, and I'll be hope your host and moderator for uh, this online event. Today, we're very pleased to have Duen Nguyen with her lecture, Recontextualizing the Dong Dong uh, Buddhist Art Gallery at the Museum of Charm Sculpture in uh, Da Nang. And you know, after Duen gives her uh, talk, uh, we will have a response by uh, Dr. Rie Nakamura. Uh, and finally, at the end of the, of the webinar today, we will take some questions from the audience. So throughout the, the program today, uh, you can feel free to type your questions into the Q&A chat box. So uh, make sure you type it in the Q&A box uh, and not the chat box. Uh, and then we will, we will take your questions afterwards. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Duen. Uh, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, History of Art and Archaeology at the School of Oriental and Asian uh, African Studies, uh, SOAS, University of London. She is also a staff member uh, of the Museum of Charm Sculpture in Vietnam. Her research focuses on the sculptural art uh, of Champa and other museological issues. Uh, so, uh, Duyen, uh, over to you. You can uh, unmute your microphone and, and turn on your camera and proceed with the presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, so, uh, good evening from Vietnam. I'm Xuan Nguyen. I'm a staff of the Museum of Charm Sculpture in Da Nang, as uh, Conan already introduced. Uh, but currently, I'm on leave to write my thesis. As part of the lecture series, Decolonizing, Curating, and the Museum in Southeast Asia, I'm very happy today to bring in a case study from Vietnam. Uh, thanks, Stephen and Conan, for inviting me to this series. Uh, my presentation today is titled Recontextualizing the Dong Yung Buddhist Art Gallery at the Museum of Jam Sculpture in Da Nang. Okay. Um, the lecture will include four main sections. The first. Uh, so, sorry, to, uh, just to interrupt. Uh, you have to share, share your um, slides. We aren't really. Oh, sure. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just click, click uh, share screen on the bottom of the. The zoom. Okay. Uh... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, got it now. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry for a technical error. Um, so my lecture today will include four main sections. Uh, first, I will briefly introduce the Dongyun Buddhist monastery and the collecting of religious fragments at this site, so that you all have a general view about the site of Dongzheng, the practice of uh, Buddhism at this site in the 9th and 10th century, and the excavation works in 1902. Uh, second, I will talk about the display history of the Dong Yung Gallery at the Chan Museum in two periods. Uh, from 1936 to 2004, and from uh, 2009 to the present day. Uh, third, I will address some controversial issues related to the curation and display of Dong Yun Buddhist artifacts at this gallery, particularly since its reopening in 2009. And finally, 
I will um, propose a decolonizing approach in the display of Dongyun Buddhist art gallery. Throughout my lecture, I would argue that the current display is an attempt to recontextualize the original landscape of Dongyun Monastery and the significance of Dongyun Buddhist art tradition. However, due to the use of modern museological devices, insufficient interpretation, and the gaps caused by absent objects, what results in a decontextualized display, which is largely inaccessible to museum viewers. My analysis of the display also aim to provide a context uh, within which we can see problems in the curation of this gallery from the colonial to the post-colonial periods. And now let's start. Um, the remains of the Dongyun Buddhist uh, monastery are located at the village of Dongyun in Tangben district, Guangnam province, about 65 kilometers to the south of the Cham Museum today. This is an important Buddhist establishment of the Chamba Kingdom in central Vietnam, at least from the late 9th century to the early 10th century. The inscription C66, as you can see here, this inscription found at the site reveals that King Jaja Vakman. Uh, King Jaja Indra Vakman II came to power in the year 875 CE and he established the Indrapura dynasty. The king ordered the construction of this Buddhist temple complex in dedication to Lakshmindra Lokeshvara. Lokeshvara was the Buddhist deity of compassion and also the protector of the founding king of Indrapura dynasty. The practice of Buddhism flowered, uh, flowered in Dongyun in this period, but this could have happened earlier. The Dongyun complex were abandoned since the late 9th century and gradually collapsed. It was seriously destroyed during the Vietnam War. Today, the only significant remains at the site is this gate tower. Here is the gate tower and the inscription C66. So in uh, 1902, Henry Bakmangti and Jacques Cabot conducted an excavation at Dongyun and collected a large number of sandstone sculptures. Uh, the two uh, publications, as I list here, provide photos of the site together with extract from excavation journals. The excavation remained uh, re, uh, the excavation revealed the plan of the site to um, uh, of this Buddhist temple complex. The site, uh, the, the, the monastery were built on an square axis uh, um, uh, about 1,300 meter long, consisting of three successive enclosures, each one surrounded by a brick temple, uh, a brick wall. Like this is enclosure tree lying to the east of the complex and it has an assembly hall for Buddhist monk, which is called the Vihara, a pedestal with narrative panels about the life of the Buddha Sakya 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 statue were found inside this enclosure together with other fragments of Buddhist monk Dhammapalas and Divas. And enclosure two, house the vestiges of an open building are properly functioning at a mandaba um, for the main temple. Four statues of the Varapala or the guardians of gate, uh, guardian of the gateways were excavated in this section. And finally, this is the enclosure one, standing to the west of the complex, is consisted of a gate tower uh, it's consisted of a gate tower, as you see here, a central Vairochana temple and a main temple are uh, dedicated to La uh, Lokeshvara. And also there are auxiliary shrines surrounding the main temple. Bakmangtie and his team found here a pedestal assembled from blocks of stone showing narrative uh, of the Buddha life and sculptures of Siddhik Deva and Arhat. So here are some photos of the Dongyun site during the excavation in 1902. Uh, photos are today preserved at the archival center of the Ecole Francaise d'Estrime Orient in Paris. They can also be seen online 
if you visit this website of the Echo from Service Stream Orion, uh, come to this link and uh, find the form Vietnam and search for Dong Duong or Cham or Chamba. And then you can see more photo about the excavation in 1902. So inscription and sculptures at Dong Duong show, show clear evidence of the emergence of uh, Vakrajana, a strand of Mahayana Buddhism in Chamba. Uh, Buddhist imagery is also associated with the Dong Yung art style in the stylistic development of Chamba art. Buddhist sculptures found at this site show a very distinctive iconographic program thus testifying to the encounters of Buddhism and Hinduism and the mingle of Cham indigenous elements together with Buddhist art tradition of China, Java and India. So after the excavation in 1902, sculptures were moved to the Musée Cham de Touran to be displayed at the Dong Yun Gallery. And other sculptures were also sent to the museums in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City and overseas museum. The Musée Cham de Touran were open to the public in 1919 and it was expanded in the year 1935 with the addition of two wings here, Mi Sơn and Thak Mong. These two wings were, uh, uh, were added to, to display the sculptures collected from the side of Mi Sơn and, and Bing and Thap Mong building. The Dong Yung Gallery, as you see here, the Dong Yung Galleries were added to the back of the original building at this time. The installation of the Dong Yung Gallery started in 1935 and finished in 1936 the year when the museum was officially inaugurated under the name Musée Harry Bocmontier. So here are some photos showing the installation work in this year. We can see uh, here the pedestal from the enclosure one, enclosure one and two statue of the Varapala from enclosure two and a Buddha head. And uh, this is the giant Buddha that were discovered in enclosure tree. Um, and here is uh, some stone block from the pedestal found in enclosure tree. And in this photo, we can see this is a, a head of a Buddha that I will discuss later in this presentation. And uh, this photo of the Dong Yun Gallery before the year 2004, when we started a very large scale refurbishment for this gallery. Yeah, so these photos show the Dong Yun Gallery back to those years before the FSP project. So as we can see in the photos, this old gallery had some shortcomings. First, stone block of the pedestal of enclosure tree was separated into different uh, groups like here, one uh, and here. Um, and this separation into different groups break the original composition of this pedestal. Second, sculptures were fixed uh, to the walls or cement blinks and they were poorly lit. Third, narrow circulation space has caused bottlenecks uh, in this area here and here, the transition from other galleries to the Dong Yun galleries. The bottlenecks block the flow and view of the visitor. And the FSP project started in 2004. It was sponsored by the French government with technical assistance from the staff of the Guimet Museum of Asian Art in Paris and the Leco uh, Francais d'Estrime Orion. The project enabled the Chan Museum to um, modernize and reorganize the Dong Yun Gallery so that it can better uh, represent the site of Dong Yun and the, uh, and the religious and aesthetic significances of Buddhist artifacts found at the site, which the old gallery failed to do. So this is the floor plan of the Dong Yun Buddhist Art Gallery following the FSP project. Sculptures have been grouped into many clusters as you can see on my screen. Group one, two and three represent sculpture excavated from enclosure one, two and three. 
uh, respectively. Group 1A consisted of a statue of a diva and two broken statues, which were discovered in the auxiliary shrines of enclosure one. And group four, group four, group four featured the bronze statue of Tara or uh, Lasmindra Lokeshvara. And this Buddhist, uh, I mean, this bronze were found in 1878. Before entering the Dongjun Gallery, the visitors are directed to walk through uh, a small space showing black and white rings of excavation of Dongjun and Mitsun from 2002 to 2004. This is an open traffic pattern, an open traffic pattern. So visitors can move freely uh, within the exhibition space. However, in terms of organizational clarity, it can be argued that the grouping of sculptures into three main sections, one, two, three, plus an, uh, an, um, an auxiliary space and a devotional icon space, um, help the visitor to contextualize the original layout of the Dongyu Monastery and better visualize where the sculptures were excavated at the site. Yeah. So this slide show how the galleries look like since the completion of the FSP project to the present day. Uh, it's remained the same uh, except some small changes. So as compared to the old gallery, this new one look much better, right? As we can see, the new galleries look like uh, a, modern, a modernist display. Walls are painted in white, Narrow windows are set high near the ceiling uh, to, to limit uh, the natural light in daytime. Spotlights are used to, to illuminate the sculptures on view, especially when it gets dark. And sculptures are positioned on high plinth or pedestal, uh, which distance the objects from the viewers and at the same time, reinforcing the ideas of religious objects at untouched untouchable and untenable. These museological devices, um, uh, I, I mean, the museological device or visual technologies are, are used to, to enhance the sacred atmosphere of a Buddhist temple, and at the same time, to highlight the aesthetic values of the objects on view. However, the recontextualizing of the Dongyu Buddhist artifacts inside the museum has also posed some controversial issues. Uh, first of all, white is a signifier of a modern art gallery. White walls and pastel shade create a neutral exhibition environment. This neutral environment had to alleviate the sandstone sculptures and the lighting effects and strengthen the aesthetic experience of an art gallery. However, it contrasts with the atmosphere of the traditional Buddhist temple, which is often dark. Thus, the Dongyun galleries evokes the ambience of a Buddhist art gallery rather than a Buddhist temple. Uh, moreover, religious objects are these desacralized and decontextualized once being relocated inside a museum. The sculptures from Dongyeung Monastery have been isolated from their original context in this secular setting. They are transformed into works of art and they are appreciated for their aesthetic, uh, art historical and art historical values. Their social and religious functions are much reduced if not deep right, when they are viewed inside the museum at three-dimensional objects. Uh, and the problem of decontextualization is also caused by minimal interpretation and the formalist approach that lies behind curatorial practice. This gallery only had two introductory panels, one here, as you see, and the other here. So the two introductory panels with the same content located in parallel at two wings. Each panel is printed uh, in three languages, Vietnamese, French, and English. 
uh, giving a brief introduction about the location and the layout of the Dongyu Monastery, the development of Mahayana Buddhism in Chamba, and the collecting of Buddhist artifacts in the uh, early 20th century. All the information are summarized and condensed within a few lines. There are no group labels for a cluster of objects to explain that each group represents uh, each enclosure and the sculpture found inside each enclosure. An object label only mentions the object's name, the provenance, the dating, material, and assessing number, as you can see. I give two samples. And on each object label, we just see the title or the name of the object in three language, and other information include a provenance, dating, and assessing number here. Uh, so what we can say, yeah, and, and two more, two more objects label, one before the refurbishment and one after the refurbishment, but basically they look the same with the same information, only the color look different. So what we, 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 say, what we may say here, I would say that museum viewers are likely to find it very difficult to understand the significance of the sculptures in the gallery due to this lack of contextualization. By offering minimal interpretation, the curator somehow turned Buddhist art, uh, sculptures into artworks and invites the act of viewing. This abrupt to art appreciation uh, may be favor uh, at art museum. However, it might make some viewers feel intimidated because the objects are unreachable given that Dongyun Buddhist imagery may not be familiar with contemporary audiences. And another controversial issue at this gallery is the mixing of some statues. Here, I, I, I take three examples. The first one is the divorce at Group 1A here, Group 1A. Currently, this group show three objects uh, a complex statue of a deity called Diva and two statue pays uh, with remains of legs and lower bodies. The excavation in, 19, in 1902 revealed the structural remains of seven auxiliary shrines on the inner face of enclosure one. And here, uh, one of the seven auxiliary shrines surrounding the main temple at enclosure one. And each shrine were probably dedicated to a deity. So a group of identical statues were found at this enclosure. Um, they could be planetary deities or directional guardians. They are depicted sitting uh, in, in the position of ease uh, with the right hands touching the right knee, the right knee and the left hands, the left hands hold an attribute uh, like a dagger. All deities have this, the same head halo, like here. All deities have the same head halo, brows, ear ornaments, uh, facial expression. After the uh, excavation in 1902, the Eiffel disposed some identical statue and fragments. The most intact ones were kept for display at the Dongjin Gallery at the Chan Museum, while others enter the collection of the Rickford Museum in Switzerland and the Cleveland Museum of Art in, in the US. Here, uh, you can see, this is the one at the Chan Museum and this one now at the Cleveland Museum of Art in the US. And this one uh, belong to the collection of the Rickford Museum in Zurich. And the Rickford Museum also have um, a bust of uh, a deity probably, probably belong to this same group um, in their collection. Uh, the second example of mixing statues is the two statue of Bodhisattva uh, sitting in the Royal East. Yeah, here, the, the photo of these sculptures. They were found uh, as a symmetrical pair ones were kept for display at the Dong Yun Gallery and the other has left Vietnam many years ago and uh, later it entered the collection of the Rupert Museum. 
So this one today belong to the collection of Rupert Museum and this one uh, currently on view at the Charm Museum and its location is here on the pedestal of Rook Tree. Um, so the Rongyung Gallery today displays the group of divas and the statue of Bodhisattva as I mentioned. However, there is no label to explain the excavation context, the meaning of these statues or the absence of other statues that were uh, once belonged to one group uh, and related to each other for religious function. And the third example of mixing objects in the Dongyun Gallery is the head of the giant Buddha. This Buddha were found in two separate parts. Yeah, here. So this is the giant Buddha on, um, uh, uh, which were found at the site. The Buddha were found in two separate parts, uh, the legs buried at enclosure tree and the Tokso lying in the central temple of enclosure one. This is a complete one after um, a worker already assembled the bits together. The head were broken before the excavation in 1902. Two heads were also found at the site. However, neither of them seem to belong to this Buddha. After the excavation, one head was sent to the Guimet Museum of Asian Art in Paris, and the other was displayed at the Dongyun Gallery for a while before it was sent to the Louis Finot Museum, which is today the National Museum of Vietnamese History in Hanoi. So this photo shows the giant Buddha, yeah, with a cement head. These cement heads were added to the talk show to the body of the giant Buddha after its arrival to the, uh, the Chan Museum in 1936. Um, when the Dong Yun Gallery were refurbished, the cement head was removed and the statue returned to its original condition without the head. Uh, recently, the Chan Museum made a replica. Uh, of the Buddha head from the Museum of Vietnamese History in Hanoi and put this head onto the body of the Buddha, though this is not a good match. The display of this reproduced head has caused many debates regarding the integrity, the authenticity, and the aesthetics of the statue. Yeah, so in this slide, I will show you. This is the photo of the giant Buddha together with other pieces collected from enclo enclosure tree that I took uh, during the, the, the opening ceremony of the Dongyun Gallery many years ago. And this Buddha belonged to, this Buddha head belonged to the collection of the Gime Museum. And this one today belonged to the collection of the History Museum in Hanoi. So we are not sure if any of the heads belong to the, uh, the, 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 the giant Buddha. And today, the Buddha on display at the Cham Museum with a head reproduced from the original one in Hanoi, as you can see. Okay, uh, I will move to the next part. And in addition to the mixing statue at this course, the, the Dong Yun Gallery also showed the absence of the people who took part in the excavation in 1902. Archival photos and excavation uh, journals show the participation of local people, uh, mainly side workers, uh, which were called coolies, um, in addition to French archaeologists. And here, here are some photos to illustrate my point. Like this one showed Chuck Kabul supervising the clearing at Enclosure 1 in September 1902. And this one showed uh, workers or coolies making equipment in front of the central temple to evacuate the rock walls. Or this one showed Bob Monte and other side workers removing a sculpture at Sun Sun on 17 September 1902. Uh, however, the gallery has almost silenced the work of these local people. The small photo exhibit gives us a glimpse into the picture of colonial archaeology. Yeah, here in this section, the photo exhibit. And 
Um, so we just have a glimpse into the picture of colonial archaeology with the leading role of French people. However, we also want to know about the participation of the local communities back to those years. So um, <clears throat> what we should do, what we should do to better this gallery in this section, I would like to propose a decolonizing approach in the display of the Dongbyung Buddhist Art Gallery. Uh, first, it is about contextualization, which I have discussed at length in the last sections. So I think it is necessary to diversify information formats and content to provide more contextual information on the sculptures on display. Um, Curating an exhibition is not only about installing objects, but also about providing information about what is installed. We can do this by adding more introductory panels about Buddhism in general and the practice of Buddhism in Chamba with a focus on Dong Zheng. Uh, the Chan Museum is basically a religious arts museum, however, Nowhere in the galleries can we see test panels with introduction to Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, we also need to add more group labels to each group of objects and, and rewrite some objects label so that the visitor can understand the religious meanings, the functions and the excavation context of these Buddhist sculptures. And not less important, Digital devices should be used to give visitors different means of interpretation. Uh, like we can use a such device like flipbooks, AV projectors with film screenings, a free stands with touch ring or, or handheld device, or at least black and white rings. And uh, I would like to show some Buddhist art galleries which offer uh, some interpretative panels and digital devices that the Chan Museum can follow. This is an exhibition uh, titled Imprints of the Buddha's Buddhist Art in the National Palace Museum Collection. And from the very beginning, there is an introductory panel to introduce Buddhism, yeah, before we just continue to other galleries. Or uh, this uh, exhibition, Ancient Religions at the ACM Museum, uh, there is also an introductory panel uh, to, to talk about the arrival of Buddhism and Hinduism in Southeast Asia. Or at the v &A Museum in London, uh, test rings are used uh, to, to help uh, visitors understand more about Buddhist symbol uh, uh, before they go around the galleries to see the sculptures on view. Or oh, this photo, uh, this is the gateway to Himalayan art um, at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York. Um, this introduction uh, show, I mean, this introduction section show a large multimedia map at the inter, uh, to, to highlight the regions of Himalayan cultural sphere. Or back to the v &A, the Buddhism, uh, the, the, uh, this room, um, um, you, we, we can see the gallery provides interpretative, interpretative panels and labels in addition to movable prints and visitor can check the rings around the galleries while contemplating the sculptures. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned the missing of some objects in the Dong Yun Gallery and their whereabouts at overseas museum today. So the question is, is this possible for these objects to be returned to the Chan Museum? so that the gallery could be more contextualized and, and visitor could gain a more coherent understanding uh, of the Buddhist art of Chamba. Um, currently, I, I think there is little chance for restitution of Dongyung Buddhist artifacts from overseas museum. And speaking of this issue, Ms. Ayn Vung, the director of the Museum of 
royal antiquities in Hereskiri, which also has a Chamba gallery of nearly 80 sculptures on display, said. Because of the obscurity surrounding documentation and provenance of artwork, the outcome for a successful restitution campaign is very uncertain. The legal path to claim restitutions of artwork rem removed under colonial rule are very complicated and expensive. Uh, so if attempts for restitution are not successful, I think the display of reproductions as substitute for sculptures now in the collection of overseas museum may be considered, uh, although this is not the best curatorial practice. Um, and, and also the questions of repatriation for the mixing objects are maybe incorporated into test panels within the gallery to openly discuss this museological uh, this museological challenge. And lastly, a decolonizing approach also means to integrate local communities into curatorial work. For the case of the Dongyun Gallery, this integration can be done by representing local people into the picture of colonial archaeology, uh, because this is still a missing part at the current gallery. And integration can also be done by bringing more local people to the gallery and making them feel connected with these Buddhist artifacts uh, despite some historical rupture. And, and thus, we can help to, to appreciate a cultural legacy that left for us by the ancient Chamba people. Yeah, thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for, for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, could I now, um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just pressing uh, stop, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much, Duen. And uh, so can I now invite uh, to respond to Duen's uh, talk, uh, we have Dr. Rie Nakamura. Uh, really can uh, un unmute yourself and turn on your, your camera. Uh, Dr. Rie Nakamura is uh, currently a visiting researcher at the Asian Cultures Research Institute in Toyo University, Japan. Uh, she received a PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington. And uh, she was a program officer at the Toyota Foundation and has taught at the School of International Studies at the University of Uttara, Malaysia. So, uh, Dr. Nakamura, please. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I okay? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to thank to for organizer to invite me to join this very interesting um, seminar series. Although I'm not really museum specialist, actually I'm not really um, studied about museology or I'm not, not a curator or anything, but um, I've, been, I've been working on the Cham people in Vietnam and I've been in, very interested in how they've been represented in museums. So in that regard, I had a lots of opportunity to, to see uh, Champa artifacts in different museums. And one of the museums is what um, Ms. Zuen is is working right now and I uh, thank you very much Duen, for um, introducing us very interesting gallery of your museum which is Donzun. Donzun gallery is not really so well known actually it's a very significant period of art artifacts I think uh, within the Champa history but comparing to me some comparing to other Hindu um, artifacts it's not that well known, but today I learned it's such a beautiful um, Buddha statues and also the Donzun sculpture was really exquisite that I really enjoyed watching these nice um, pictures and also it's quite thought provoking your um, presentation. And what I, I don't think I 
can cover all the topics that you mentioned. And I'm, I'm going to concentrating on something that you said about this contextualization and how this contextualization can um, can decolonize the museum and the museum artifacts. And I think this notion, contextualization of artifacts is really, really significant. And I think your presentation is that is really suggestive uh, of how we can decolonize the, the museums. Um, I visited Champa Sculpture Museum probably the first time was 1993 or 1994. And at that time I was actually, I was horrified to, to see the museum um, because this, this museum was so different from the museum that I visited in, in Japan and other countries. First of all, artifacts were cemented on the wall or you can go around and touch it if there is no guards are watching you. So this is really, and there aren't so many explanations that it's almost like, like plungered artifacts decorating this be beautiful museum. So this isn't, it's more like decoration of the word tolerfees. That's what I felt in the, when I looking at the museums. So, but contextualizing all these artifacts, the significance of artistic significance and also historical significance, I think it is one step to um, decolonize and to look at the artifacts, not just uh, the things that have been like dragged from somewhere uh, as a uh, what trophies. And I think that's the way to sort of kind of decolonize the artifacts in the museums. And this, besides this, I, I found it this um, Champa, I'm sorry, Cham Sculpture Museum in Danan. It's been very innovative of doing some um, decolonization things. I don't know if they are doing it purposely or unpurposely, but I found it. It's quite interesting to see this museum's development. They went through the various um, renovations uh, since 1936. They did in 2002, 2009, and the major um, renovations been done in 2016 and 2017. And Cham is... Uh, which we believe that they are the people who are like a majority majority group in, in so-called Champa kingdoms. And as you can see that in a political geopolitical map right now in Southeast Asia, there is no Champa because it was banished due to the southern expansion of the Vietnamese. And that's the, the fact. But then this is really sort of, in order to create a national discourses, <laughs> saying that, you know, they, they disappeared because of the southern expansion of the Vietnamese people is not really quite fit into the national national discourses. So usually what happened if you go to the national museums, they don't talk about these things. And they do showing the Champa art in national museum in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, but then they never really discuss the historical background. And also the important things that they never really discuss the connection between Champa, which is the political entity, which is vanished a long time ago. And the people who remained within in the territory of Vietnam nowadays, it's nation state, as an ethnic minority people. So this kind of connections trigger the sort of the past memories which everybody wanted to forget in order to create national discourses that 
it's kind of taboo to see the champa and cham at the same time. However, this Champa Sculpture Museum did this sort of tabooed um, exhibitions. Now new renovated um, exhibition in Champa Sculpture, Cham Sculpture Museums, they start showing the ethnic uh, materials of Cham people on the second floor. And that really indicates that actually the people who did initiate this uh, civilization did exist and that's how, how they were living. So this connection to me is kind of astonishing to see. And also this museum uh, had an exhibition of Cham artist called Dan Nan To. And he does sculptures and also the oil paintings, or he does, he's a painter and also sculptor. And um, they had exhibition of his works and his work is quite unique in a way that um, he describe who they are with their own sort of kind of vocab religious vocabularies. Um, there is a um, very sing significant kind of yin and yang kind of concepts that Champa, Cham people have. And usually his painting and his artworks is based on this yin and yang notions. And this, it's really showing that how Cham people perceive the society, how Cham people perceive the history is really representing um, their view. And this museum um, had his works exhibition. I thought this was extraordinary. So it's quite interesting that Cham he, um, sculpture museums kind of creating like count an arena of the counter discourses or antithesis and providing uh, multiple view to, I'm not saying that which one is good and which is one was bad, but it's kind of contestations. You know, there is a different views, plural views, plural like perspectives. And this museum can host um, exhibition like this. I think it is quite interesting. And Going back to um, Zuen's argument of the Donzun gallery, how to um, decolonize this gallery, I, I think it's already um, museums well done to decolonize uh, this uh, exhibition by contextualized and, and also even presented that a house has been discovered and how the colonial people treated this artifacts and how they're treating this artifacts. And that's also an, one attempt to showing that, um, attempt to, to, to decolonize the, the galleries. And I, I do agree with her that um, Contextualization is a very significant method to decolonize the artifacts. And I think um, she can, or she or this museum can do um, various kind of things to decolonize this uh, art galleries by um, bringing more historical, to, to putting this um, galleries within more historical point of view, for instance, Don Zun galleries is a really um, unique Mahayana Buddhist um, galleries. And Mahayana Buddhists somehow in Southeast Asia are very short lived, like have a, some sort of relationship with Borobudol in Indonesia, for instance, or uh, um, some people might argue that it's uh, um, some influences of Chola dynasty. And if we uh, see this galleries from the like more dynamic historical movement, I think it can be a little 
can be um, can be con can contribute to the uh, decolonization of the galleries. And I think you can do so many different kind of things. It can be a more like experimental things to decolonize the artifacts. And I'm I'm very much looking forward to see what is going to happen in this galleries. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Well, thank you very much for the interesting presentations, Ren. Thank, hey, thank you, you so much, Rie. Uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, thanks. thanks. So, so um, I guess what we, we can do is, uh, well, Duyen, do you have any uh, maybe responses directly to what Rie has just said? Uh, um, okay, let me check. Yeah, um, personally, I, I agree with Rie uh, um, in one point that um, um, actually, currently, uh, we, we, we need to have more uh, exhibitions um, that features uh, the life uh, or the artists of contemporary uh, Cham people. Um, because there is something like a, a, a disconnection between the past and the present. And in recent year, we already added a, a gallery on the second floor. This is about the, uh, the, the cultural life uh, of the contemporary Chan people. And, um, and um, with this exhibition, our former director uh, hope to, to provide uh, visitors with more information uh, or to, pro to, to, to provide a continuation uh, for the sculptures. Yeah, so it's like a move from sculpture to the, the current, uh, the, um, how to say, um, uh, the, from sculpture to the current life of the, the Chan people in Vietnam. Yeah, and, um, and uh, we hope that in the future, uh, we will have more exhibition like this, uh, featuring the Chan people and their artists. Yeah, and um, and um, how to say um, when we talk about decolonization, um, we uh, I mean this term uh, when I apply to the Chan Museum, what I want to to emphasize is that the Chan Museum is were built during the colonial period, and we have uh, employed. Uh, a formalist approach in the curation or in our curation, yeah, in our curational work, yeah. But now we are going to change this. We are going to recontextualize not only the Cham Buddhist gallery, but also other galleries to provide the visitor with more information on the objects on view, yeah. As I already said, curating an exhibition is not only about installing the objects, but also about providing information on the objects that are installed. So it's the, our effort to recontextualize the Dong Yung Gallery and also other galleries of the Chan Museum by adding more means of interpretation and uh, add uh, with more and, and offer more devices, especially digital devices for the visitor in the coming years, I hope. Yeah. Thank you, Duyen. Yeah, it seems like from both of, uh, from, from your talk and from Ria's uh, response that uh, sort of contextualizing the, the display a bit more in terms, especially plugging it into the broader Buddhist networks that the, um, the, these sculptures, these temples were, were part of, uh, it is very important in, in kind of decolonizing them. So we don't just see them as, as uh, isolated objects, but you know, as kind of vital parts of uh, these networks that uh, was, were in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, and and it's, it's great to, uh, I mean, are, are you, so, so are, is the museum uh, making some, um, it's great to hear that the museum is thinking of uh, employing these uh, strategies to, to contextualize the material. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on something that um, uh, Duyan, you mentioned, you, were, you, you had at the, uh, uh, talking about at the end of your presentation and, and, and Ria, you, you kind of uh, alluded to with the you know, contemporary child artists, uh, being you know, able to give a very useful perspective. Um, you know, Duane, you, you mentioned that uh, 
it, it, one of the decolonial strategies would be to get local communities a bit more involved. And I guess not, not just uh, contemporary artists, but, but also people who live, yeah, as, as, as we said, people who live in the areas uh, where, where the, the museum is uh, and where all this uh, art was found. Uh, uh, is there anything that you know, you're doing or do you have any suggestions on how these local, local communities can be brought in better to, to um, interact with the, the museum and the, this place? Um, so about the artists, we just talk about the contemporary charm artist, and yeah. uh, what we already mentioned is about exhibitions uh, uh, of the artworks made by the contemporary charm people. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I see one question: Is this about involving local people? And um, actually, to understand the Dongbu Buddhist art is not easy, and as I already mentioned in my lecture, there is a disruption, uh, we call a rupture between the past and present. The, 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 the current, uh, I mean, the kind, of Buddhist, uh, the kind of Buddhism that we practice today may be a little different from the kind of Buddhism practiced by the ancient Chan people in the old days. So in this case, we, we, it's not easy to, to, to invite the contemporary Chan people into our curatorial work. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I just mean that we can decolonize by providing more interpretation means to understand this kind of Buddhism in the past, but we should offer more means of interpre interpretation for the current visitor so that they understand more about the past, but we are not sure that the contemporary people can understand, totally understand the, 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 the true nature of this kind of Buddhism in the past. Yeah. So uh, I, I see uh, one question is, uh, you mentioned involving local people. Can you talk about how and if any, the gallery is involving local Buddhist monastery, temples, monks or nuns, and how they view the museum? Yeah, so currently, we, I think we, we haven't invited any Buddhist uh, monk or nuns, or we haven't, we haven't worked with any uh, Buddhist, um, uh, uh, I mean, with, with any uh, people work, working at the Buddhist monastery uh, to, to work or to cooperate with the curator at the Chan Museum. But I think in the future, if we want to better our Buddhist gallery, we have to work with others from the Buddhist monastery, at least uh, for, the, uh, for the writing of the panel test about the introduction of Buddhism at this gallery. Yeah, how Buddhism came to Southeast Asia or uh, how Buddhism came to Chamba back to those years. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, great. Um, well, yeah, perhaps we can take some more questions from the, from the audience as well. Um, there's a question from uh, uh, Mr. Adam Krishna Tan. Uh, I think this is more for, for Duyan, uh, asking about the iconography of the seated Buddha. I, I guess the there's a large Buddha that you were uh, presenting earlier. Um, could, you com could you comment further about this sculpture and the iconography? Uh, yes, um, I'm happy to address this question. Actually, this Buddha we call the giant Buddha or the colossal city Buddha. And uh, this Buddha will found at the side without the head um, and the bodies, um, on, only the, the body remained. So the, 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 the Buddha, um, how to say, uh, existing in, uh, in a, existing with the legs in parallel and uh, when we look at the, the, the robes that the Buddha wear, the 16th exposure or the hands gesture, um, we can find some similarities with uh, the Buddha uh, uh, in Chinese um, Buddhist art tradition, especially those from the Tang Dynasty. And I have written a very long essay on this Buddha. Um, you, you can see the catalog vibrancy in stone in which we talk about this uh, Buddha and we, we show some, uh, how to say, artistic connection between this Buddha with the Buddhist tradition uh, in China. 
in, in China uh, back to the ninth, eight or ninth centuries. And, uh, and so far, uh, so far about the identity of this Buddha, this is also a controversial issue. Yeah, some identify this Buddha as the Buddha Sakyamuni, but uh, the others argue that this Buddha may be a, ma a Maitreya Buddha. Uh, Ria, do you have some? you have something to add uh, to that? About the Buddha head? No. <laughs> uh, did you see? It? Did you see? It? Do you remember it from uh, when you visited the museum? Yes. Uh, I think I saw the head at the first time. But then there is no head when I visited recently, I think. Mm -hmm. Probably you visited the museum after, um, I think after 2009, the, because in 2009, we reopened the gallery. And at that time, uh, the head were taken from uh, the body of the Buddha. And it's remained like that for a few years. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly it because during this year, I, I, I studied in the United States uh, and then I went to London to, to, to do uh, my PhD. So I, 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 I didn't know when the, 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 the reproduced heads were, uh, were added to this uh, giant Buddha as you see today. Yeah, but it just happened recently, I mean, in recent years. Okay, um, well, oh, uh, let's take another audience question um, from uh, Sujata. Um, she asks, uh, you know, she says, thank you for sharing your research about this fascinating topic about curating sacred objects. Um, she's wondering how the museum overseas uh, are displaying the, the missing objects that you you talk about, uh, Du Yin. Uh, do they address any of the, the issues of acquisition and absence um, that, that you found? Um, how, how to say? Actually, during the years living abroad, I traveled to some museums uh, in the United States and uh, in Europe, which have the collection of Chamba sculptures. And uh, I haven't seen any overseas museum openly discuss the issue of restitution. Yeah. So today, we know that there are many mixing objects uh, in the galleries of Dong, in, in the galleries at the Cha Museum. I mean, not only the Dong Byung Gallery, but the other gallery as well. And um, uh, in recent years, restitution is a very hot topic. Yeah, it is discussed widely. Yeah, um, and I hope that in the future, uh, overseas museum also uh, think about this issue and um, and have a conversation with the charm museum uh, on the return of some charm sculptures, if possible. Thank you, Duan. Uh, Ria, Ria, I wonder if you have a perspective on this because you've written a lot about you've written about um, charm representing charm in Vietnamese museums. But uh, do you have any thoughts on how charm and champa is uh, represented in overseas museums, like uh, what uh, Duyen has mentioned? Uh, you know, museums which have overseas museums which have collections of charm sculpture. Actually, I unfortunately I don't think I ever seen any charm sculpture or charm things outside of Vietnam. I don't think, but there is um, this repatriation of or, or, or of the artifacts. I think it is kind of tricky it's it's very complicated things because again for charm they might say that why vietnam will take it back i mean country of vietnam which means that there are so many um religious sites for instance it's been like, they don't have control over anymore. Like, 
for instance, once they were um, um, assigned as a national monument or a historical heritage, and then it's been controlled under the Ministry of whatsoever, like Ministry of Culture or Ministry of Education, and then they will lose the control over the site. For instance, like there is a one, there there is a towers, and well, I should not say tower, but the the, the Hindu Hindu temples that people will do the Chan people do a ceremony four times in a year, and they only open like four times in a year and rest of the year it was closed. But because the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Tourists wanted to sh show that, you know, the show that inside of the temple for the tourists, it's now it's open 365 days. And there is so many different things is coming in. Every time I went and see that it's like a Vietnamization of the Cham culture. And they did not know, say, they could not do anything. But th this is their historic, they, actually they, this is the, their religious site, but they don't have any control over. So they have different kind of feeling toward artifacts, even though it's a historical you know, things. Because they, they now there there are some sort of um, doubled colonization from the point of view of Cham, and how they gonna deal with this sort of double colonialism might be a very big challenges for the Museum of Champa sculpture. And actually, I think that they, they were really doing good job in order to cope with this double colonization of the Cham people. I think they were really doing like innovative things that I'm very much looking forward to see what kind of things that they're gonna do in future. Yeah, th thanks, thanks very much, Vier. That, that's a really good point. And I mean, I think uh, in a lot of um, uh, form, formerly colonized countries in Southeast Asia and all over the world uh, are face, you know, facing the same issue where uh, colonial museums, uh, when they become kind of national museums, then the narratives kind of change from co the colonial narratives and then they start being used to serve the state. And, 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 some, and sometimes people, some people like kind of fall through the, the cracks in a way, or, or as you say. Um, uh, do, you, uh, do you have a response uh, to, to that? And, and uh, you know, the, what, what the, the, Cham, the Cham Museum is, is doing? Um, you, you, you are, sorry, I, I, I were um, a little absent-minded in the last few minutes because I, I just read over some uh, um, oh. questions in the Q&A. Okay, can you no, remind no, no. me again? Yeah, just just uh, wondering if you have any uh, uh, rest, uh, comments on on what Rie has shared um, on on the you know kind of tensions between with tourism and and uh, at, at charm sites and, and I mean how the the charm museum is is uh, really um, you know shaping the narrative uh, about uh, art charm art uh, today. Um, I, it's not easy to answer this question. Yeah, to be honest. Yeah. So how to rewrite the narrative? Um, so far we, because, you know, currently the Charm Museum is, is, its name is the Museum of Charm Sculpture. And we focus more on art, on the art of the, exactly the religious art of the ancient Charm people. Yeah. And we are going to rewrite the narrative gradually. I, I say gradually, step by step. And as I already mentioned a few minutes ago, our former director decided to add the exhibition of contemporary Cham people. Yeah. And this exhibition, this gallery on the second floor is a continuation of the sculptural galleries in the ground floor. Yeah. And in this way, we are going to show the visitor the, 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 the present day life of the Cham people. 
Yeah, but it's not easy to document uh, the life of the ancient Cham people in the past. Yeah, so, so imagine the Cham Museum today have two sections. One is for sculpture of the past and one for the life the cultural, the daily life of the Cham people in the present. And I think in this way, we are going to, 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 to rewrite, uh, not totally, not exactly, but we are going to offer more, how to say, uh, to offer a window into the life of the Cham people. Yeah. Great, thanks, Thank, uh, thanks Duen. Uh, let's take another question from, from the audience, perhaps. Um, I see a question by, uh, uh, um, and also, I wanted to add okay. one more point. Um, so I, I talk about the in, uh, the involvement or the participation of local communities. So in my opinion, I think like in the future, I, I would like, actually we already did that. We already did that. When we opened the, the, the exhibition on the contemporary Cham people, we already invited many Cham people from Ninh Thuong and Binh Thuong province. We invite many scholars to work with museum curator uh, in preparation for, the, for this uh, gallery. And I think in the future, we, we should maintain this uh, relationship with the Cham people in other provinces uh, in our work. Great. That sounds really uh, interesting, and I, I look forward to seeing more more of that. Um, so, actually, along along those lines, there's a there's a question by uh, uh, Parita Konantako on how do Cham community members, and I I guess also I would expand that to to say like how how do visitors to to the museum, uh, you know, any any of the museums uh, visitors to the museum think of uh, the headless Buddha images. You know, if, if they are Buddhists, do they feel like it's their duty to keep religious images in perfect condition? Or do they think of images as archaeological artifacts and not religious objects? And, you know, because obviously in Vietnam, there are a lot of Buddhist practitioners. Um, have you had any feedback from um, visitors about that? Uh, um, uh, which question can you, uh, can you mention the name of? Uh, the people, uh, I mean, the, uh, like the question by, by Parita Konandako. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I see. Um, um, actually, today, how to say, we, we don't have any evaluation section at the Chan Museum, sadly. Yeah. Uh, is it something that we should do? Yeah, to know how the visitors think uh, or how they feel about the gallery. Um, so should, we, we still don't know how our visitor think about the headless Buddha images. Yeah, the headless Buddha images. Um, and yeah, so how to say, what we say, it's just about, uh, it's just from the viewpoint of curators, not from the visitor. Yeah, so I'm sorry to answer this question that we still don't know how Cham community members think of headless Buddha images. Yeah, but uh, in the future, I mean, in the step to decolonize the museum, we should have this kind of evaluation, uh, how to say, um, uh, 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 to, to, I mean, this kind of evaluation section or, uh, or we should have a way to know the feedback from our visitor. Great, yeah, I definitely think audience feedback also is a way to kind of, uh, um, to, to further decolonize the museum as well, to get uh, feedback from what, what they have to, to think, uh, to say about the, the displays. Uh, so, you know, I have some questions, uh, you know, come talking about um, the kind of complex situation that the Charles Cultural Museum position, has to position itself in, I'm just kind of going to um, uh, take uh, maybe Jay La's question. Uh, but I think you've kind of addressed this already, Duyen. Uh, the question is, you know, does the museum hold workshop to the local community and then ask them for their thoughts uh, on, on the rupture between old uh, Champa and contemporary Champa? You, you, you know, you talked about, you know, in the exhibition bringing in local communities in, uh, and, and you're kind of developing that contemporary Charm Gallery, right? Um, yeah. Did you have anything further to add to that? Uh, 
what, what you what you said or, or yeah things? actually we uh, how to say um, we don't have any kind of workshops uh, but I, I already mentioned a few years ago when we opened the um, the, the exhibition about the contemporary charm before we we did invite uh, some scholars, jam scholars from uh, Ning Thuong and Bin Thuong to work with uh, museum staff in preparation for this gallery. But um, uh, we, we hope that in the future, we, we can work more with the local communities from the, the provinces. Definitely, that would be really interesting. Uh, so we, you, you kind of uh, dropped off for a second, but you're still there. Uh, so we're coming to yes. the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, great. Great to have you back. Uh, yeah, coming, we're coming to the last 10 minutes of the of this program. Just wondering if, uh, yeah, Rie, did you have any um, other comments or any other questions you wanted to pose to the end that uh, we can take so far? Um, since she's talking about the part, like involvement of the Cham people, I. Uh, I just wanted to mention about these two local uh, museums organized by actually Cham communities. One is in Bintuan and one is in Mintuan. And I, well, Nintuan is a little bit more, um, well, I shouldn't say, should not say scientifically done, but it's, it has a very long history and it's been like really renovated and give a lots of thoughts and some FAO scholars also involved in. So it's been kind of nicely organized. But the one in Nintuan, uh, Bin, sorry, Bintuan province, the Cham Cultural Center, I think this museum is quite something. Actually, I, when I visited, I was really shocked because it was a mess um, in terms of like chronological order and everything is like so mishmash that I did not know what they trying to, to do with this museum. So there is a um, Dinga and Yoni lying there and some um, other religious sculptures there and contemporary pictures all over the wall and it looks really chaotic and so eclectic it's, it's like I, I thought what is this but then I realized that when I went through these um, exhibition one by one what they're trying to say is sort of continuation of the past in present I mean, I'm sorry, existence of the past and present. And the, the message that this museum wanted to, to tell us is a continuation of the existence of the Cham people from the ancient time till now. So, of course, they display the last queen of Champa. She passed away a decade ago. And I think it's her... Um, family still living in Bintuan. But this, this is a really different approach to the artifacts comparing to what um, Cham, Cham Sculpture Museum is, is, is dealing with. And I think it might be interesting for the museum curator in, in Cham Sculpture Museum to, to kind of communicate with local so sort of, probably they are not really professionals, but how they view the artifacts is quite different. And I think it might be very interesting to have some sort of exchange. For instance, like Nintuan Province's Cham Cultural uh, Research Center, they have a display of the uh, uh, cow, sculpture of the cow, cow nandin. It's usually Judy is sitting in, in the temple. And this Nandin is showing us, the viewers, his butt. <laughs> He's not showing us his head. 
This is because usually Nandin is facing to the gods that when we approach to the temple, we first think that we're going to see is the, the behind of the Nandin. So how they display artifacts in Cham Cultural Research Center is really like from the point of view of the local people. And then I found it, it's quite interesting. So I think it might be useful for a curator from the Cham Sculpture Museum, they are the professionals, to like interact with these local museums, uh, curators. And I think in this sense, I th local museum is equally quite significant to create like different viewpoints. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thanks so much, Ray. Have you, Duyen, have you uh, encountered the curators of the uh, Cham Cultural Research Center and the other local museum that Ray mentioned? Yeah, I visited the, um, the Center for Cham Studies in uh, several times. And uh, I know uh, the people who work there. And uh, actually, uh, the Cham Museum invited people from this center uh, many years ago uh, to prepare for the exhibition on the contemporary Cham people uh, at uh, the on the second floor of the Cham Museum today. And today we still maintain the close relationship with <clears throat> those staff. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, looking really looking forward to all the exciting things that uh, it sounds like the Cham Museum, Scul Cham Sculpture Museum is, is planning on doing. Uh, we just have so three more minutes to this program. Uh, just do you, do you have any more um, final thoughts you wanted to share or, or any final words? Uh, no, actually, um, there are a lot to talk about this museum yeah, in every aspect. Yeah, I saw some, uh, I, I saw some questions about the Tara or the Buddha, but uh, uh, I, I think today we don't have enough time to, to address all the questions. Um, and uh, and I hope that you can you can find um, if you know more you can email me you can email me and I can I can answer the question by email yeah I, I think that would be easier for me because we we don't have much time today especially though asking me about the sculpture of Tara and those about the, the giant Buddha yeah and today I will talk is more about curating and museology. Yeah, so I think those issues related to uh, art history, you can email me and I'm happy to discuss with you. Yeah, and talking about the curating of chamber, um, I, I, because our topic today is decolonizing the museum. Uh, yeah, and I work at a museum that was built during the colonial period. And I see many problems yeah, with the current curation of the gallery. So the, the Dongyun gallery that I just present, is just one example of the many, many, uh, yeah. I mean, this is just one of the many galleries at the Cham Museum that we need to decolonize. And, uh, and, and uh, I do hope that in the future, we can work more with the staff from the music, uh, Museum of Asian Art in Paris, uh, the staff from Eiffel, and uh, also the local people from Minh Thom and Binh Thom Robins or Ang Yam Robins in Vietnam, where a lot of contemporary Cham people are living. And also we, we, we hope to cooperate with the local people living in Da Nang and other to, to, to have their voice, to have their participation in our curatorial work. Thank you very much, Duyen. Uh, and actually there, there's a catalog that people can, can buy, right? Of the museum if they're interested in the uh, yeah, actually, a few years ago, oh, I'm getting older, I can't remember exactly the year. I think to, in, to, in 2008 or so, um, the Cham Museum worked with uh, Soas uh, um, to publish a catalogue. Um, and the title of the catalogue is Vibrancy in Stone. Yeah, Vibrancy in Stone, Masterpiece from the collection of the Museum of Cham Sculpture in Da Nang. And in this catalogue, we have 
introduced many in-depth essays about many aspects of uh, Chamba studies like archaeology, art history. Um, yeah, and uh, we also introduced more than 100 objects. They are really the masterpiece in our collection. Yeah, so I hope you have a chance to visit the local libraries uh, or purchase a copy. And, uh, but uh, you can also email me directly and we can openly discuss about uh, our historical issues related to the sculptures. Okay, yeah, so, so to all our audience members, if you have more, if you have questions about the sculpture of the museum, uh, please try to pick up that catalog uh, published by SOAS and the, the Chum Museum of Sculpture uh, called Vibrancy in Stone. Um, and so with that, actually, it's uh, eight thirty p.m. and and that kind of brings us to a conclusion. Uh, please join me in. Well, I just like to thank uh, our speakers, Duyen uh, Nguyen and uh, uh, Dr. Rie Nakamura. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I also, you know, we'd like to thank you all, all our audience members, for for your time and attention today. Uh, once again, just want to say that that uh, we have two more webinars in the SOAS ACM decolonizing. Uh, curating in the museum in Southeast Asia series, uh, one next Thursday and the other um, on the 11th of November, that's our last one. So, so you can sign up uh, for that on, on the website as well. So with that, um, we'd just like to um, uh, say thanks again to everyone and uh, everyone have a good, please have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.